Good evening, everybody. Can I just ask maybe that everybody put themselves on mute, if possible? Um, thank you all so much for joining us to celebrate International Women's Day. Um, this event and podcast are part of the Irish Nurses in the NHS Oral History Project, which also includes a documentary film which was um, premiered at the London, at the Irish Embassy in London earlier this month. Um, as you probably know, this wonderful project is a collaboration with the London Irish Centre and it really just aims to explore the experiences and lives of the thousands of nurses who travelled from Ireland to train and work in Britain over the years. It's based on extensive research conducted by Professor Louise Ryan of London Metropolitan University and hosted by radio producer and former nurse Gronia McPolan, and we're going to hear from Louise and Gronia shortly. Um, my name is Mary Kerrigan. I'm a trustee of the London Irish Centre here in London, in Camden, and we are a charity based here since the 1950s with a mission to empower and enrich lives through Irish community and culture. And my involvement with the project came about because of my mother, who, like the many women that were featured in this project, actually travelled to London from Ireland in the 1950s to train as a nurse. So first this evening, we're going to hear from Louise and her research assistant, Nea Doshi. Uh, Louise and Nea are going to present the findings from the oral history interviews that they've conducted with over 45 Irish-born nurses who worked with the NHS over the years. We're then going to move to Gronia, who is going to introduce the new audiogram. Um, and this latest episode, just launched today, actually considers um, really, while Irish nurses were, as we know, a, a really important source of labour for the NHS and known for their, you know, huge contribution and, and very hard work in the NHS over the years, um, that actually they also kind of had a bit of an ambiguous position um, as Irish mi migrants and sometimes came under suspicion, particularly around the time of the Troubles. Um, we're then going to go on after Gronia to hear, we're delighted to have Betty, a former nurse who features in the latest podcast with us this evening, and uh, she's going to talk to us about her experience um, of some discrimination um, as a nurse in Britain um, some years ago. Um, so that's the agenda for this evening. Um, just a couple of items of housekeeping. Um, we will go straight through the presentations for the first, probably taking us up to close to eight o'clock. And then we're going to open for Q&A. So if you can be patient, please type any questions in the chat. Um, alternatively, when we get to the Q&A, put your hand up and we can turn to you to ask a question. Um, and we, you know, hopefully we'll have a good discussion at the end. Um, final ask from us is really how you can help this evening is to share kind of the impact that you know this project, this presentation, this event tonight has on you and put that in the feedback. So rather than saying, actually, you know, it was a great event, very interesting, actually maybe be able to say the impact it had. So what it taught you about the impact that Irish nurses had in the NHS over the years, yeah. things you didn't realize before tonight. Um, so that's it. We're gonna hand over now to Louise and Neha for their presentation. Thank you very much, Mary, and thanks to Tara and everybody at the London Irish Centre for hosting this event on International Women's Day. We're delighted to be here. I'm now going to share my screen and then Neha and I will present uh, together. Let me just share my screen. Can everybody see the screen? Yeah, OK, I'm getting some nods. Right, so I'll start the recording. So the title of our presentation is Irish Nurses Navigating British Society, Essential Carers and Unwanted Migrants. Oh, I just need to do the. Uh, it's not um, it's not playing ball. But, oh, here we go. OK, I need to tap it several times to move the slide. We've got some lovely photographs and we're very grateful to the nurses who have um, allowed us permission to use their photograph. This is a photograph uh, lent to us by Bernie. So following the establishment of the NHS in 1948, and given the very urgent need to rapidly expand the number of nurses, there was an active recruitment campaign for thousands of young Irish women and indeed men to come to Britain as trainee nurses. Advertisements were placed not just in the big national dailies, but also in small provincial newspapers throughout Ireland. 
And then recruitment officers from hospitals throughout Britain travelled to every city and town in Ireland, interviewing potential student nurses. Now, at that time, in order to train in Ireland, it was very difficult because places were limited and it was extremely expensive. You had to pay to train. Whereas in Britain, you could train for free. In fact, you got paid while you trained and you also had the opportunity for live-in accommodation in the nurses' homes. So it's understandable that the lure of working in British hospitals proved very attractive. As a result of this widespread recruitment of nurses from Ireland, by the 1960s, around 11% of all nurses recruited to hospitals in the southeast of England had been born in the Irish Republic. And by 1971, there were an estimated 31,000 Irish-born nurses in Britain. And they constituted 12% of all nursing staff, which is about one in every eight nurses at that time in Britain had been born in Ireland. So really an enormous proportion of nursing staff. So the aim of our research project, uh, it's a three-year project, and the aim is to relate the hitherto untold stories of Irish women, and indeed some men, who made up such a huge proportion of migrant nurses recruited to work in the early decades of the NHS. The project started in 2022, it's going to run until the end of this year and in fact probably into the beginning of 2025 and we'll tell the stories of nurses through the medium of photography, digital recording, a documentary film and also the printed word and we're currently writing a book. So at this point I'll hand over to Neha. Hi, thank you Louise. Um... So our project began in February 2022 and we started by interviewing women in London, 21 women. Um, we then managed to um, expand to the whole country and we interviewed people in Liverpool, followed by Wales, Huddersfield, Middlesbrough and Manchester. Um, in January, we um, interviewed nurses in Luton and in spring 2023, we managed to interview nurses in Scotland as well. Um, so altogether, we have 45 interviews. Um, Louise, thank you. Um, just to mention that we have ethical approval from the Oral History Society, um, and also that we will be using throughout this presentation pseudonyms. So we won't be using the real name of participants in order to um, keep their keep them anonymous. Um, our participants range in age significantly. So our youngest is in their 60s and our oldest is aged 92 years old. Um, we have one participant who arrived in um, England in 1948 at the start of the NHS, um, but the majority of our participants um, moved or arrived in England and um, not just England, sorry, the whole of Britain um, in the 1950s and 60s. Most are now retired, some are working part-time, um, and so our participants spent seven, sorry, seven decades of the NHS. Um, we are also taking a whole Ireland approach, which means that we, are, we have participants from the Republic as well as Northern Ireland, and we have participants from all, um, all counties of Ireland, actually. So from Tyrone down as far south as Cork and Kerry as well. So what many of our participants noted actually was the importance of Irish nurses in terms of their contribution to the NHS. So Anita mentions, I think they were the backbone of the NHS. Um, and Ruth says the Irish propped up the NHS. Fidelma also um, mentions the contribution as well as the commitment that Irish nurses had. And she says, without the Irish nurses and without their total contribution and their commitment, I think the health service would be in a really bad place. Not only the Irish, but migrants in general were noted and have been noted since the start of the NHS as being crucial to um, the service that the NHS provides. So Nessa, who arrived in Leeds in 1957, um, mentions that they wouldn't have been, between the Irish and the Jamaicans, there would have been no National Health Service if it wasn't for them. Well, we stuck together. There was no difference in colour because, as you say, sorry, I can't see the bottom of the screen. Um, 
but you yeah I think it's okay. been off on mine um oh, but okay. the the point of um I think that we want to mention as well in relation to that quote is that there was a kind of sense of community commun communality I suppose um where the nurses did feel like they were in it together and they um experienced you know similar um experiences of, of you know working together being migrants being homesick as well as a lot of them moved into um, nursing homes and so there was a sense of community spirit but on the note of the fact that there were migrant workers um, as well as the Irish the Caribbean nurses recruited from the 50s um, and by the 1970s eight percent of all student nurses and trainee midwives were born in the Caribbean and Sheila does also mention the importance of migrant nurses to the NHS. And she says, it's always been a problem with the British hospitals. We've never had enough. There's never been enough people in this country to staff. You know, you, we depend on people from other countries. Um, Katrina, who arrived in 1960, also mentioned something similar. Um, and there are scholarly articles as well that um, you know, discuss the importance of migrant nurses from the inception in 1948. Um, so overall, our nurses feel that they were appreciated in terms of their contribution to the NHS. Um, so many remarked that Irish nurses were especially regarded as hard workers, reliable and conscientious, as well as being friendly towards participants. So Anya says they were good workers and they didn't complain. Nobody complained about anything. You just put up with it. Um, some suggested that Irish nurses were especially appreciated. So patients love the Irish nurses. You know, even now you often hear them saying, oh, a lovely Irish nurse. So there is a recognition that Irish nurses were seen overall to be very hardworking. Um, so Brona here says, Irish nurses were known to be hard workers. Um, whatever they were told, that was it. You just got on with it. However, there were in um, wider society or outside of the hospital, there were experiences or encounters of discrimination. Um, so as a district nurse in, East, in the East End of London, Bridget encountered hostility from a particular family. And she describes an incident where a man came out of the pub and accosted me, calling me an effing Irish cow because I'd got his neighbor's mother put in the home. He threw a glass of beer on me. So what's important to note about this is the fact that there was a kind of racial element to this. Um, we don't know whether it's because she's Irish, but the fact that she was Irish is noted here as and used as an insult. Um, we also had senior staff members who made remarks as well. So Orla here mentions an, an elderly sister on a medical ward. I was helping out, getting somebody a commode or something, and she heard the way I said commode, which I said in a very broad tone, and she kind of imitated me, and I was really enraged, and I thought, I hope I never bloody come on her ward. So you have staff members as well, as well as some patients who also mocked the nurses. Um, I was about a second year student, which is really young. I was early twenties, and he said something one day, something about men are first class citizens and women are second class citizens, he said, but you're different. You're a third class citizen. Um, again, the, the bottom is cut off, so I can't read it, but you're a third class citizen because you're an Irish woman um, is the point that's being made. So there was kind of a bit of hostility faced by um, our participants in the hospital as well. Thanks, I'll pass back to Louise. Thanks, Neha. And sorry that you that the bottom of the slide just seems to have been chopped off, but, but you did a great job of, of uh, remembering what was there. So yes, as Neha has been saying there, it wasn't all a rosy story for these nurses and they often encountered these awkward situations. Now, Sheila recalled a trip to the English seaside when she had a short holiday as a student nurse in the early 1960s. She said, we went to the seaside and there's landladies with vacancies and things. And you know, on the door, it says, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. I remember saying to people, why are they saying that? I'm thinking, God, they've been over to Ireland recruiting us to staff their hospitals. And here, I couldn't even stay in somebody's house if I wanted to. I mean, 
I literally wouldn't have been able to stay. And in fact, we'll hear a bit more from Sheila later on uh, when Gronia plays us an extract from the podcast. But that is such a powerful quote there. Um, sorry, I, th I think I need somebody to go on mute. I'm getting some feedback. Thanks. Uh, so that's a very powerful quote. And that was not the only isolated incident. So in response to seeing um, these no Irish signs, Maeve, who also came across one of the signs, said, I thought, whoa, so people are noticing the blacks, the dogs and the Irish, three persona non grata. You, oh, feel okay. that you, are, you feel that you are down on a dog level. When you think about it, I mean, it's not that long ago, 1975. I suppose the thing about it is, looking back, there was probably a fear that if I did go in and they turned on me, would I be able to defend myself? And we'll hear a bit more about that particular experience um, later on in the podcast. Now, Dervla arrived in London in the mid 1960s, and she also described seeing these infamous no Irish signs. She said, when we used to go up to London to the markets and things and the shows, I started realizing that in Paddington, there were a lot of signs on the windows of lodging houses saying no gypsies, no blacks, no Irish and no dogs. It was an eye opener, really a shock to the system. Now, I should just say that we didn't ask anybody explicitly if they saw these signs. These were moments that they shared with us in the course of the interview. But I think it's very important that we've collected these stories because we're talking to living witnesses who remember seeing these um, signs on doors and windows in the 50s, 60s, and even into the 70s. Now, the situation for our nurses became more acute during the IRA bombing campaigns, which of course lasted for over 30 years. So this was an extended period really from the early 1970s through to the 1990s. And several nurses recounted how specific anti-Irish sentiments around the time of the IRA bombing and how that impacted on them. For example, in Liverpool, one of our male participants, Joseph, who was a psychiatric nurse, he had moved to Britain in the 1950s and he recalled one incident. This woman on a ward I was working, she made out that I was to blame for it. She made remarks about the situation, the IRA bombings and all that, you know. And this, again, was far from an, an isolated experience. Several of our participants talked to us about how patients or colleagues said things to them around the time of bombs. In London, for example, Fanula observed that remarks about bombs in your bag were often presented as jokes or banter. Some of the patients would make comments. They wouldn't get away with it now. You haven't a bomb in there, have you? But we were nurses. We're not into maiming people. But they thought, because you were Irish, that you were the same as the IRA and all that kind of thing. Now, of course, as I'm sure many of you will, will remember, one of the most infamous bombs of the 1970s was the uh, Birmingham pub bomb. And one of our participants, Brona, happened to be living in Birmingham at the time, and she was a district nurse, which meant she was out and about uh, in the neighborhood rather than working within the confines of a hospital setting. And she talked a lot about her experiences of being Irish in Birmingham in the 1970s. She said, and that coincided with a lot of IRA trouble, the Birmingham bombing, which was absolutely, this was a bombshell blast out of the blue, and we were all damned by association. You spoke with an Irish accent, so you were a terrorist. I was out in the community as a district nurse, and you would have kept your head down. You would only go shopping. You'd have had to go into the butchers and the bakers and ask for bread and meat with your very broad Irish accent which I never chose to change in one shape or form. And that's an important point, because, of course, in the 1970s, unlike now, where you just serve yourself in the supermarket, you would have had to go into the butchers and go into the bakers and ask for particular items. So it was essential for you to speak. And that's the point she's making there about going into these spaces in Birmingham and speaking with a broad Irish accent and the kind of reactions and hostility that she encountered. 
Now, in London, Surika concluded, yeah, it was a horrible, horrible, horrible time. She felt that the political context and the backlash against the Irish impacted on her initial attitudes about settling in Britain. She said it was difficult to settle because it was difficult being Irish for a long time here. Now, so far we've heard examples of so-called banter, so-called jokes, nasty remarks, snide remarks, you know, do you have a bomb in your bag kind of thing. But it went much deeper than that. And we were shocked and saddened to hear particular stories about how patients had refused to be treated by an Irish nurse around the time of IRA bombings. And we had a couple of incidents where people talked about patients refusing treatment from an Irish nurse. So Nessa was working in Yorkshire and she recalled, I was working in the Leeds hospital then. We used to get soldiers from Northern Ireland over for neurosurgery and we never had a problem with them. It didn't bother them that we were Southern Ireland. There was a nurse. She only came from Donegal, but she had more of a Northern Irish accent. And one of the soldiers complained that he didn't want her looking after him because of where she came from. But he didn't have any problem with us looking after him. So here in this story, we can see how the soldier uh, suffering from injuries he'd sustained in Northern Ireland made this, this decision that he would not allow a nurse with a Northern Ireland accent to come near him or nurse him. A similar experience was reported by Fanula, who was a district nurse working in London. And she talked about a particular incident which occurred to her after the Harrods bomb in London. She said, I worked on the district. It was the Harrods bombing. So I went in to put this man to bed. I'd been going in there like for about four years. And I went in and he said, that was a nice job you did today. He said, I don't want you. I don't want you near me. You're dangerous. I think one of the, the most powerful things about this story is that she had been looking after that man for four years. And yet suddenly in that moment following the Harrods bombing, he just took against her. Her Irishness became the most significant thing about her and he refused to have her treat him anymore. So we've presented some very hard hitting experiences uh, this evening, but we feel that these are very important stories that need to be told, shared and recorded for posterity. The examples we've presented here, which will be further expanded and elaborated in the forthcoming book, they really illustrate the point that has been noted by the researcher Bronwyn Walter. And she has argued how Irish people have occupied an ambiguous position in British society as much needed workers but also as undesirable migrants and indeed as potential terrorists. We've discussed some of these painful experiences of how our participants navigated these ambiguous positions. As we said, they were actively recruited from Ireland. Recruitment officers went from British hospitals to actively encourage these Irish young men and women to come to Britain to work. Yet despite their professionalism as healthcare providers, they were undermined, criticized and suspected, damned by association with the IRA. Moreover, it was also clear that the NHS provided no training or support for Irish staff who were being attacked, insulted or humiliated by patients, especially during those very difficult period um, around the time of the bombing. The nurses were just expected to get on with it. Now, in many ways, our participants said that they had tried to forget about these experiences. But we are very grateful that they chose to share those stories with us. Sometimes they told us that they'd kind of almost forgotten about those incidents and they hadn't really spoken about those experiences very much. But we are very grateful that they chose to share them with us because we do think it's vital that that harder story of Irish people in Britain is told and is recorded and is better understood. I'll hand back to Neha now, who's going to just wrap up with some of our um, next steps and thanks. 
Thank you. Yes. So just to mention that um, these are all our outputs to date. Um, we had a photographic exhibition at the London Irish Centre as well. Um, we had, as uh, Mary mentioned, a documentary film that was premiered at the Irish Embassy. Um, an archive of interviews, a series of podcasts, um, which Gronje is going to present you a sample of today. And, hope, and we are hoping to get our book out in 2025 on if i'm correct st bridget's day um yes. yes so those are all of our outputs and we'd like to thank these organizations um for funding our project um especially the london irish center who was hosting us today um as well as we'd like to thank um our recruiters um who you can see here on our slide So that's the end of our presentation, and we are now going to go seamlessly over to Gronia, who's going to talk to you about the podcast. And as Mary mentioned at the beginning, please hold your questions and you can type them in the chat uh, later on, and we will have time for Q&A. Over to you, Gronia. Thank you, Louise, and thank you, Neha. And I also would like to th uh, thank you, Mary and uh, Tara, for organising this and for um Betty for, for appearing today for, on, on our behalf. Um, we're delighted uh, to be able to um, showcase the wonderful work that the Irish nurses have done in helping to build the NHS. And really, they were absolutely marvellous um, and they ought to be applauded. Um, we're doing um, a series of podcasts. It's a limited series of podcasts, 13 podcasts, and we launched them last July the 5th, which was the 75th anniversary of the founding of the NHS in Britain. And it was it was it was a very exciting time for us all, really. And because it was real, you know, it was really happening. The nurses were being heard finally. And we we are absolutely thrilled to bits about it. So we've been releasing one podcast every four to six weeks, and we will be continuing to do that right up until the release and the launch of our book. And it's it's a story, it's basically the trajectory of the story of the Irish nurses who went to Britain to work and train as nurses. And the each episode of the podcast sort of talks about one sort of chapter in the story and we're at now episode nine which I've just dropped online and you can find it wherever you find your podcasts on Apple or Spotify or Acast or wherever you get your po your your podcast from and I've just dropped it just literally before we we started our event tonight so in uh, celebrating International Women's Day so we, we've done episodes on recruitment, leaving home. What was it like, you know, arriving in Britain for the first time, then the nurse training, becoming a nurse. Um, we also did a special episode on the Liverpool story about all those, the women and the men who left Ireland and went to Liverpool, particularly who to become nurses. Uh, we looked at then another episode about the social life and the bright lights of London, particularly. Um, the nurse's home, life in the nurse's home, um, home away from home, um, the uniform, belts and buckles, um, the hospital wards, the patients, perceptions of Irish nurses. And then this particular episode then is about the anti-Irish discrimination that they experienced and they felt um, when they were working and living in, in England during the time of the Troubles. Um, we'll go on then to the, the next episode will be about marriage and family and then we'll be going into where they went in their careers in their nursing um, experience and also visiting family at home and keeping the home connections alive and then also the actual contribution the Irish nurses made to the NHS um, would be one of our final episodes. So I'm going to just, I've done a small montage, of uh, just 10 minutes of just little key moments in the podcast and the, the podcast series, and also um, just some clips about this particular podcast, this particular episode. 
So I'm just going to share my screen and, and I'm going to play this out. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. And um, OK, so here goes. Welcome to the Irish Nurses in the NHS podcast series. 2023 marked the 75th anniversary of Britain's National Health Service. Since its inception in 1948, there was a huge demand for nurses as the new health service was being rolled out across the country, particularly during the 1950s. I think we all thought nursing in London was so romantic. And we were standing there, he said, how are you getting into London? We don't know. He said, come on, I'll take you. So that was pure luck. Do you want to come to London? Well, yes, of course. <laughs> if you're going to do this nursing and you want to go, you have to come with me now. And the lady in the B&B &B rang the police and thought we'd run away from home. When you get off the train, just follow the crowds. <laughs> I didn't know where I was coming to, did I? I still remember her name so well. And she had a zip from her throat to her pubic bone. I want to be with people, I want to be around people. And that's where it all started, really. The active recruitment campaign launched by the National Health Service in Ireland attracted thousands of young Irish women with the offer of free training, accommodation and the chance to earn a wage during their nurse training. I arrived at the nursing home. It was a nursing sister that used to be the home sister. She opened the door and said, oh, a new girl from Ireland. And there, there was accommodation, obviously, included, and it seemed quite a safe place to go to. When you leave Ireland, I mean, for the very first time, it can be quite frightening. So my mother was actually quite happy that I was going to a nurse's home. We stuck together a lot. And that was the support network, I think. And I loved the nursing home cooking, washing together, you know, parties together, whatever else. It was good. It was really, really good. In fact, the, where um, our nurse's home was is now a car park. So, you know, no, no nurse's homes anymore. They've no. gone. Well, living in a nurse's home at low cost, with at least a little bit of money every month, surrounded by other Irish girls, probably, of my own age, that can't be too bad. I remember the Beatles before I left Ireland and my brother. We were looking at these four lads on the way we must have had a television. And then when I was going to Liverpool, I thought, this is wonderful. I'll see these four boys. It was awful, I was bunked downstairs, it was like a cattle boat. I never stopped crying. My sister said to me one day, if you don't stop crying, I'm going to send you home. I missed my husband at um, ballroom dancing lessons at the Odeon Cinema in Liverpool. We learned together and of course it was ideal for, you know, for the rest of our lives to dance. Well, I had great fun. It was a different kind of fun than I had in Cork, because I had a, I had a great time in Cork. A sidecar of a motorbike. The men would pull up, said, you want to lift girls? Someone would get behind him on his pillion, and I'd get in the sidecar. And he'd drive us off to the hospital again. They all knew we were nurses. And we went to this disco. But obviously, you know, it was like the United Nations. It was packed. But then trying to get back, you know, on the train, I still don't know how we ever got back. Coming from Ennis and from Limerick, where I trained, where you knew everybody, it was very different. I remember on a Sunday, Sundays were always very lonely in London. If I see somebody not well, I have to go and ask them, which is none of my business, but I do go because there's something in you as a nurse that never leaves you. And I always remember the first day I put a uniform on us and one of the, the I don't know, one of the tutors said, you know, remember, she said, you've got a uniform on you now. He said, you have to be able to confident inside. I'll never forget my friend. If you had one spot on your apron, you had to go to the nurse's home, change it straight away. I was horrified the way they were dressed. 
baggy trousers and tops and you wouldn't know who was who. Um, I'm glad they got rid of the hats. They were a bit of a pain. Dreadful, awful, really. I hated it. In this episode, we hear the first-hand accounts and negative experiences faced by the nurses as Irish migrants in Britain and especially at the height of the Northern Ireland Troubles. In Liverpool, John, whom we met in episode three, recalled that he was often addressed by a pejorative term instead of by his own name, reminding us that the culture of anti-Irish stereotyping pervaded the social fabric of society. Well, it was strange at first, and um, with my accent, people were, what did you say, Paddy? Everybody calls you Paddy then. <laughs> No, but they did. It was, uh, it's no good, no good protesting. That was the way it was. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. In a way, John was resigned to the prospect of being addressed in this way, and he wasn't going to fight it. I don't think the Irish ever had any resentment. They used to call me Irish, but it didn't make any You know, but, but then I felt it was endearing kind of way. Noreen came over to Britain in 1961. She didn't take umbrage to being addressed as Irish, instead of by her name. Indeed, she found it rather charming. You'd go in when you were in the operating theatre, say, you'd go in on a Monday morning, you'd be in there, you know, and the consultant would come in and say, oh, morning, Irish, have a nice weekend or something. He'd you call you Irish. Yes, I know, but, you, but I can't ever remember taking... I can't ever remember it offending me. And then you were obviously there as well in the NHS during the, the times of the Troubles. Did that yes. impact you at all in Not any way at all? At all. Not, I can never remember anybody saying anything nasty to me or about the art. It, it, it was just kept separate. That's what I always felt. But something was troubling her. Taking a deep breath, Noreen recalls how she stumbled across a sign on a bed and breakfast during a trip to the English seaside. An encounter that she'd felt somewhat unsure about sharing with us. Okay, I'm going to say this, and my, my family said to me, oh, don't repeat that, Mum. It's the first time I went to the seaside when I came over here. You know, we went out for a day to the seaside. I think there was a trip out, and we went to the seaside. And, you know, there's land ladies with vacancies and things. And, you know, on the doors, there's no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. So you actually saw that? Oh, I've right. seen it. But they said, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. And I remember saying to people, why are they saying that? So in my brain, I'm thinking, God, they've been over in Ireland recruiting us to staff their hospitals, and here I couldn't even stay in somebody's house if I wanted to. I mean, I literally wouldn't have been able to say. It said, no do- no blacks, no... Well, I think that's well known, isn't it? It is well known. That's well yeah. known. I've seen it. Yeah. Down in South... I remember going, and I remember saying, why are they saying that about the Irish? Perceptions of Irishness differed depending on the context of the incident who made the remark, and its implication on the person it's aimed at. This is Marion's story. And I had the patient and I was to take him up. And before, it was only eight o'clock when we had just handed over. And, and in he comes, the door's open and he goes, why isn't this patient upstairs? And I said, oh, and I said, I'll be up in a minute. What do you mean up in a minute? I said, I, might have that I said, I'll be up in a minute. I said, I need to disconnect reconnect them on portable batteries. I said, and I'll be up in a minute. Oh, you stupid Irish woman, what would you know? And I said to him, Doctor, an old boy like you, heart attacks, palpitations, and all that sort of stuff. I said, it's bad for you. I said, now will you go away? Leave me alone. And I said, I'll be up after you. And I could not believe it. He turned on his foot and went. But I think it was about challenge at that time, about how you challenge them. And I wasn't rude to him or anything. The patients had a different perception of her as an Irish nurse. I felt that a lot of them loved, uh, the patients in particular, loved to be looked after by the Irish nurses because they felt they were kind and caring and compassionate. If there was any perceived hostile behaviour, the Irish nurses could support each other, particularly within the hospital setting. But on the day-to-day sort of work in front, I never found that um, I had any issues with people generally and I think that was probably because it was a huge collection of Irish nurses and students that we could support ourselves. 
when she was off duty, away from the relative security of the hospital and other Irish nurse colleagues, it was a different story, especially when the bombs went off. So saying that, but do you think that people had a particular view of Irish nurses, Irish people I think, in general? No, I think that, uh, I mean, obviously this, the 70s was, 75 was a bad, bad year because of the Birmingham bombings and that. And I mean, the things that were off putting during that period is I remember walking up and I went in, I thought, oh, I'll get a bar of chocolate or something. And on the door was written, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. And I thought, ah, oh. on the door of a shop. Yeah, yeah. And that was the first time I thought, ooh. And you do, you, you sort of taking it back. <laughs> Good. So everybody, this is Betty, who was one of the participants in our project, and we're delighted that she's come along this evening to share her experiences with us. And Betty, there was a particular incident that you talked about, which was, again, like some of the other nurses in the PowerPoint presentation, particularly associated with an IRA bomb. Would, would you like to tell us? about what you experienced as a nurse at that time. Um, yes, hello everybody. Um, I was nursing as a district nurse in Scotland and listening to all of the stories there now, I just realised that in Scotland, we seem to have been very lucky because I have worked in Scotland for a long time. Um, and before that I had, I did my training, my midwifery here and really never had any problem. But this particular story, it was awful. Um, I had very similar to Joseph. I had been going into this house for some time to do a general nursing care on an elderly lady. She lived with her daughter and her son-in-law. The two grandchildren were at school. I was usually there around about 10 o'clock, half past 10. And on the Sunday of the Enniskillen bombing, which I'm sure most people will remember, the next morning on the Monday, I arrived at the house at my usual time, knocked on the door as I usually did. And it was usually the daughter-in-law, the daughter, um, the lady's daughter that opened the door. But this time, as soon as I had my hand on the door, the door opened and it was the son-in-law and he just looked at me and he said, you have some nerve coming here today. And I have to say, I had had nothing to do with this gentleman. Um, he certainly was there passing when I was at, at visiting. So I, you know, I, I was really quite taken back. I, it didn't occur to me about the bombing at all. And he, I came in, he opened the door wide and I came in and he really verbally accosted me. I had some nerve and who did I think I was and um, look at the damage I did and we did. And it was suddenly then that I realized it was because of my accent. He had never came, he'd never spoken to me before. The daughter and the mother that I was dealing with the mother actually came from Northern Ireland, from the same town as I was living in at that time. So I, I didn't know what to do. But anyhow, I kind of got my nerve back and I said, look, I'm really sorry. I can't do anything about it. I've nothing to do with it. But I really do need to see your mother-in-law. And eventually he murmured and moved away. But his wife was in tears she was very badly affected. So anyhow, we went up the stairs. The mother-in-law had heard all the commotion going on and had heard what was said. She was apologetic. So I had to say to them, look, we've got to get over this. Let's get on with this. And we, I fixed the lady up, gave the daughter a hug and just said, look, it's all right, honestly. 
So I came out and you know yourselves, we all have two faces. So I had my work face on when I was in the house. But when I got into the car, I was shaking. And I honestly didn't know what to do. I had several other patients to go and see. So I did that. I went ahead and did them because you're on a time scale in the community. But at lunchtime, instead of going home, I went straight back to the office and I told my boss. And I have to say, she was absolutely fantastic. She wanted to know if I wanted to report this. And I said, no, I didn't. Because the other side of the coin is, I didn't know what this man had gone through. This wasn't as obvious as in England. In Scotland, we never seemed to have this bother at all. So I don't know what his background was. Maybe something had happened to him that he despised the Irish. But anyhow, my boss had said to me, look, you know, we'll take you off the, the that particular part. And I said, no, I don't want to, because it's not fair on the patient. She was used to me. I know we have to, if we're not there, somebody else comes in, but she was on my list. So I came, went back the next day and he sat in the corner and he never opened his mouth. I never mentioned it. And the mother-in-law, the daughter and the mother never mentioned it again. And I have to say, like I, actually, when I was speaking to Louise that day, I had almost forgotten about it until the very end of our conversation. And I suddenly remembered it because I had put that to the back of my mind because I was shocked. It's as simple as that. I was shocked by what had happened. And I didn't tell anybody outside of my own family because I think a bit of me was ashamed. I thought maybe I, you know, I had depicted something that he had picked up. And of course my boss kept saying, no, that's not what it was. It was just in the way he was at that particular time. And he took it out on me. So, as I said, just like some of the other ladies and Joseph as well, you put it to the back of your mind. But I have to say it was a very, very horrible incident. Well, thank you very much, Betty, for sharing it with us again, because I think it's it's all very well for us to say it, but to hear you say it in your own words, mm -hmm. it's so powerful and we can see that it's still so overwhelming almost yeah. now all these years later that was in the 1980s the Enniskillen yes. bombing yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean it is definitely true to say that I don't think there were any bombs in Scotland so that's there probably weren't. why you know it, it didn't affect you until that one incident unlike and, England and oh Betty's frozen and Betty's the other frozen. thing is we're very near to the north of Ireland the west of Scotland there were people from Donegal an awful lot of people from Donegal and from the six counties that came here to do their, I came here to do my midwifery. I was one of hundreds of nurses that came to do their midwifery. Scotland was well renowned as a great place to do your midwifery. So that was how I came. I met my husband here. We went back to Ireland, but then we moved back to Scotland permanently. And there were a lot of us, but because I think it was, there were so many here, we had no, there, thankfully, there were no big, as you say, incidences with bombs or thankfully anything like that. And I think that's where we were saved from. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Betty. And, and I think, as you absolutely said there, people did push these incidents to the back of their minds because yeah. when we were doing many of the interviews, People would often say, oh, no, I never had any bad experiences. No, nothing like that ever happened to me. And then later on in the interview, they'd say, oh, oh yes, but that that incident did occur. And in fact, I'm, I'm not speaking about you here, but another lady that we interviewed had said, no, nothing bad ever yeah. happened to me. And then she proceeded to tell us one of those incidents where somebody had refused to be treated by her because she was Irish. So it is maybe a coping strategy that that people I think push so. them to the back of their mind yeah yeah definitely so, yes yes I, I'm just wondering um is the podcast um how are we getting on Tara I guess I can give it a go here it could be one moment okay it was lovely so Betty thank you very much for that and and that we 
got you to speak earlier than you had anticipated. But it, that was wonderful. And we'll come back. Maybe there'll be Q&A later on and we'll come back to you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Tara, over.